Hey, I'm Nick Caldwell. I've had a, about 15 year career in technology. I worked at Microsoft, becoming a general manager, then went on to Reddit where I was VP of engineering, and now I'm chief product officer at Looker. So if you're here, you're either looking to get your first job as a software engineer, or congrats, you've already got one. I'm gonna give you six tips to supercharge your engineering career. Number one is the most important, underlies all the other things I'm gonna tell you today, and it's very, very simple. If you're an engineer, that means you're responsible for producing high quality code on a predictable schedule. The best thing that you can do to help yourself and your teammates early on in your career is simply come in to work and code as much as you can every day. Become an expert that people go to for advice and tips, learn a specific functional area, and deliver what you say you're going to deliver on time. Tip number two is gonna be a little bit more difficult, and it is don't wait to be told what to do. And this is gonna be really, really hard because you're a new engineer and you're probably used to being told what to do by senior architects or your manager, but you've got to get really, really comfortable being proactive about figuring out what you should do. When I started my career as an engineer, I spent probably the first month talking not only to my manager, peers, other managers, the director, if I could get coffee with them, about all of the challenges and problems that they were dealing with, either within their own teams or company-wide. And what this gave me perspective on were the ways that I could help out. So the thing I want you guys to remember, don't wait to be told what to do. Instead, talk to people and ask them the following simple question. What would you do if you had an extra pair of hands? And if you ask that simple question, you'll be inundated with opportunities that you can use to advance your career. Number three, and this one is going to be even harder to understand because I know for number one, I told you coding was the most important thing that you could be working on. But number three, it actually takes a lot more than coding and software engineering to ship products, all right? So even though I want you to spend all of your, most of your time learning how to code, it turns out you're just part of a team of product managers, designers, marketing, salespeople, business development people, all working together to ship whatever product you're working on. And as an engineer, I want you to remember that although the most important role that you play is producing solid code, to advance your career as quickly as possible, it will help you to understand the role that all of these other people play in producing software. So I'll give you an example, and that will be how you as an engineer should think about interacting with your product counterpart. Uh, as an engineer, again, you're responsible for producing high quality code on a predictable schedule, but the question is, not so much what you're going to build and how you're gonna build it, but why it needs to be built. And who answers that question? That's the responsibility of the product manager. The product manager looks out into the market, talks to their counterparts in sales, marketing, uh, uses their own intuition as well as uh, insights from speaking to the engineering team and others within the company, and synthesizes all of that knowledge down into what's called a product roadmap. And that product roadmap is supposed to best reflect how the company should be spending its time and engineering resources. The job of the product manager is to figure out that roadmap and translate it into something that engineers and everyone can understand so that their efforts can be focused. So that's why it's important to be a team player and understand your role in the overall organization. All right, number four doesn't have anything to do with coding at all. It's about networking. And although you should, again, be spending the majority of your time learning to code and write high, high quality software, in the long run, what will matter is the people that you know and the relationships that you build. If you think about it for a minute, code uh, over time depreciates in value. The uh, lines of code that you write, the frameworks that you use are all going to change over time. When I started my career, I was learning C++. You watching this now are probably coding in Python or JavaScript. What matters in the long run, though, are the relationships that I built when I was a junior engineer, because those people have since gone on to become directors, VPs, CTOs, etc. And I can guarantee you that the best opportunities I've had in my career have come from those relationships that I built early on. So there are multiple ways to build your network. Uh, the first is very, very straightforward. The people that you work with 
Impress them with your ability to get things done by being a good team player. Nothing beats working side by side with someone and building a personal relationship that over time will increase in value. Second, spend a little bit of your time every week asking someone who you don't work with every day out for coffee or even just to bounce a few ideas off of them. Uh, early on in my career, I probably spent just about an hour a week asking people out for coffee and it paid off uh, dividends in the long run. And then the third thing is if you want to spend even more time focused on networking, you may need to allocate time outside of work, uh, going to professional events or uh, meetups or other places where you can find people like you interested in the same topics, hopefully coding and technology. Number five, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And what I mean by this is if you're going to have a career in technology, you have to accept rapid change. Now, it can happen in a lot of different ways. The one you're probably gonna be familiar with immediately is technological change. JavaScript frameworks seem to change every three months nowadays. By the time you end your career, you'll likely have learned around five to 10 of these things. So tech will be continually changing around you and you should be open to that and have a strategy for how you're going to, to keep up. More importantly though, is the non-technical aspect of change what you work on, why, who you report to. A very, very critical example that you will eventually have to uh, get accustomed to is reorganizations. These happen when, when the broader company decides that a team or a project needs a different type of investment or a new direction. And these are one of the scariest things that can happen to a new engineer. But I want to tell you that reorganizations are one of the best opportunities for you to advance your career. It's gonna be very, very rare that your executive or your director or who you report to is forced not only to reallocate teams, but to explain to the entire organization why that reallocation needs to occur. So if you want to advance your career as fast as possible, there's a very simple trick that you can use. Move to where your executive team is allocating resources because that means uh, you're going to always be working on the most important project within the executive's mind. Number six, this is a difficult one. It's imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is the feeling that you don't belong or aren't qualified to do the job that you currently have. And as a new engineer, just stepping into the role, you're probably gonna feel this pretty frequently, but the good thing is, uh, and you should realize this early on, everyone feels imposter syndrome. You can look at, at it as a negative, something to be afraid of, or you can embrace it. Because if you feel imposter syndrome, generally what that means is you are learning something. It means that you have found the right balance between being comfortable and uncomfortable, and you're in the zone where you're going to be learning as quickly as you can. So don't fear imposter syndrome. I encourage you to seek it out and also know that anyone who's doing anything of significance is probably feeling it too, so you're not alone. I do wanna talk though about uh, a syndrome that's maybe even worse and, and more subtle than imposter syndrome. And anyone who's gone through a boot camp will feel this for sure. It's called just happy to be here syndrome. And just happy to be here syndrome is when you go into a role and they ask you how you feel, how things are going, and you say, I'm just happy to be here. And the reason that this is so damaging is because it limits what your upside potential is career-wise, right? Because if you're just happy to be here, you're happy to do anything. Your manager wants you to stay over the weekend? Sure, just happy to be here. Uh, pick up a project that you're not interested? They'll do that too, uh, just happy to be here. Um, Maybe a teammate or your architect not treating you well, maybe being unfair on your code reviews, but you'll put up with that too because you're just happy to be here. You have to get over this mentality as quickly as possible as someone coming in from uh, a boot camp or uh, accelerator program because to unlock your full potential, you have to realize that you shouldn't just be happy to be employed, that you actually have extremely valuable skills and insights that are gonna move whatever business or project you're on forward. You are an expert. The fact that you have the job means that you have to get beyond just being happy to be there and bring your full self, your full insights, your full expertise 
into the role. So I'll give you uh, an example of a moment I overcame my just happy to be here syndrome. And it was the time I got to present uh, to Bill Gates, who was my childhood hero. Uh, the context uh, is that I've been working on a project sponsored by Bill Gates. Uh, he hadn't, hadn't met him in person, but we had to go present the status of the project to him at his office. And Bill Gates's office is gigantic. It is a, a large complex overseeing Lake Washington. You have to go through a secret elevator to get up in there. It's got its own television studio. I mean, it's a, a large and impressive room. I was sitting there with uh, Bill, Satya Nadella, and leaders of many of Microsoft's billion dollar businesses. And at this time, I was a senior uh, engineer uh, working within the Microsoft Office organization. So I was incredibly nervous to be surrounded by all of these, I guess, billionaire experts. My turn came up and I presented for 30 minutes uh, to Bill Gates and the folks in the room. And over that time, Bill was asking me questions about the technology I was working on. In memory, uh, in natural language search for in memory databases is what the topic was. And at that moment, I realized, I, although I was happy to be in the room, I was actually the expert among all of these people. And that they could not get this project done without someone like me. Even though my title was only senior engineer, I knew more about how to get this done than anyone in the room. And to finish that story, Bill ended up sponsoring the project. And it really launched my career. I went on from that project to become the general manager of Power BI and so on and so forth. The thing I want you guys to take away uh, from that story though, although it feels like you've gotten lucky that you just got this, this awesome new job in tech, you have to be more than just thankful for that because you have a whole set of opportunities that will open up to you if you are fearless and know that you can be the smartest person in the room, even if it's a room full of billionaire executives. So those are my six tips for how you can supercharge your engineering career. If you've got comments or questions, hit me up at the link below and follow me on Twitter at Nick Cald if you wanna connect. Comment, subscribe, and let's break in.